task is to speak on scaphoid non-union. And uh, this is an extremely common problem that we will encounter in clinical practice and um, something that uh, is a dilemma for a lot of people. So it is generally defined as a failure of healing uh, by about six to 12 months from injury. <clears throat> and uh, Joe Dias in his seminal work on scaphoid, uh, in one of his publications, he observed that it is difficult to determine union um, and it is usually unreliable if the um, injury is less than three months uh, from at presentation. The usual presentation at around six to 12 months when the scaphoid is not united would be deemed as a non-union. And uh, scaphoid non-unions have this defined and demonstrated uh, predisposition to progress towards arthritic changes of the wrist joint. And this has been very well described by uh, in the study of Mac uh, and Gelberman. <clears throat> and this is called as a snack wrist. And, and a missed scaphoid non-union or an untreated non-union can have very debilitating outcomes and thus uh, this importance of recognizing and dealing with this appropriately. <clears throat> so briefly, the objectives of the talk would be to understand the basic anatomy and the pathomechanics and some classifications. And based on these classifications, what are the treatment recommendations for the management of scaphoid non-union? We will try to understand the uh, techniques in the management of non-union and very briefly understand what snack risk is and what the options for this entity are. <clears throat> so here's a case example. This is a 17 year old uh, young student who is a semi-professional football player. And he injured uh, his wrist about four months ago, but uh, we think it was a little earlier than that. And at that time, he presented to another hospital with complaints of pain, especially on strenuous work and activity. And this pain was alleviated on rest. <clears throat> and he, sorry, and he had pain in the wrist and splinting was advised. And he continued to have pain and he presented to us uh, uh, about at six months. And he had these presentation um, findings and uh, the initial x-ray, we looked at the initial x-ray and uh, we didn't think much was going on in the first x-ray, although we felt that there was something going on here, very not uh, clear. <clears throat> and then um, after about four months, when he came to our clinic, we got this ulnar deviation, radial deviation view, where we found that uh, there was something definitely going on at the proximal pole of the scaphoid. So what next? Uh, well, we obviously would go on with imaging and what are the options that we resort to? Uh, computed tomography, CT scans, MRIs and bone scans are usually recommended, of which uh, CT scan is perhaps uh, very sensitive and very appropriate for such presentations. And this is the clinical picture on the CT scan. And then these are the coronal and the sagittal images, again, uh, demonstrating the non-union and the bone resorption at the fracture site. <clears throat> so these uh, first few slides uh, with the case example pretty much are the most common case scenario that uh, you would encounter in clinical practice. And this is more often than not the, uh, the process in diagnosing scaphoid non-union. Once you diagnose scaphoid non-union, what are the treatment considerations? And you may uh, grossly classify them as uh, those related to the fracture or the bone itself. And these are uh, the location of the non-union, the classification, the duration since injury, whether there is a gap or pseudoarthrosis with resorption of the bone, whether there is a DC deformity, the vascularity of the uh, fragment or the non-union, uh, especially in relation to a proximal pole non-union, whether there are any arthritic changes already set in, and if there are any associated injury, for example, an untreated or a missed transcaphoid perilunate dis dissociation or uh, dislocation, or maybe a scaphoid injury that may be associated with a scaphoid non-union. Patient factors are usually those of the age of the patient, the dominance, the demands, comorbidities, as well as smoking. And then certain factors obviously also play a very important role in my opinion. And these are uh, related to the training of the surgeon, uh, the choice of the implant, more often than not the availability of proper implants, 
own graph, graph choice and so on and so forth. So all of these will perhaps have some kind of an impact in the outcomes when you're dealing with these fractures. So way back in 1966, Barton uh, observed that the scaphoid is an awkward but important little bone. And we all know that this is a boat shaped bone and that's where it arise, derives its name from. And the anatomy of the scaphoid is not alien to a lot of us. Suffice it to say that it is a very peculiar bone in saying that it is an obliquely oriented bone and then it crosses both carpal rows. And it is a very important part of the proximal carpal row where it is attached by the scapholunate ligament to the lunate and the very important scaphotrapezial and the scaphocapitate ligaments, uh, which kind of uh, are important in maintaining the kinetics and the kinematics of the wrist joint. <clears throat> this is important we'll see that uh, in, in a few slides about uh, when we talk about the DC deformity that is associated with scaphoid non-unions. Anatomy is again uh, very well described. I will not belabor too much on this, but this is an important slide. And Richard Gelberman in his seminal work again uh, has studied the vascularity of the scaphoid in great detail. And there are usually two blood vessels that will supply, one through the waist, which supplies the proximal pole, the distal pole and the waist, whereas the proximal pole is relatively avascular as compared to the, uh, the distal pole and the waist. And this is because the nutrient vessels will kind of go forward and give a reverse branch uh, to the scaphoid. And therefore, this part of the scaphoid is relatively avascular. And this is something which is very important to take into account. And then those of you who are oriented to uh, understanding why femoral neck fractures are more prone to avian, we can draw analogies from femoral neck fractures in saying that there is a tenuous blood supply. Uh, it's an intracapsular fracture. The scaphoid lies within the joint completely, and therefore it is akin to being an intracapsular fracture. There is no true periosteum. Uh, the fracture configuration, that is to say a very oblique fracture line for that matter, will render it to be unstable and prone to non-union. And then there are high torque forces at the fracture site. <clears throat> the mechanism is usually due to a fall in an outstretched hand. This is again something that all of us are very familiar with, usually seen in males and those who are involved in sports and outdoor activities. And we have to recognize that Perhaps the most important preventable cause of scaphoid non-union is failure to recognize the fracture at the get-go. So please keep in mind this particular point. There is an inadequate initial treatment at times and improper assessment of the bone healing. So all of these are perhaps the most common yet preventable causes of non-union. And of course, delayed treatment or inadequate treatment a lot of times. And uh, that's, this is simply because fresh fractures may not be evident on initial x-rays. And therefore, it is perhaps better to err on the side of over-treating these fractures than otherwise. Physical examination of a patient presenting with non-union uh, will usually be that of restriction of movements and pain on strenuous work. These are the criteria that Javad Parvizi, who is now very famous for hip surgery, hip and knee, uh, way back uh, in uh, 1998, he said that tenderness in the snuff box, tenderness of the tubercle and pain on actual compression have a 100% sensitivity for uh, diagnosing uh, scaphoid fractures. I'm talking about fresh fractures here. However, the irony is that most of the scaphoid non-unions may not be painful and that is where the catch is. So we need to have a very high index of suspicion uh, when you have these patients coming to the clinic. Imaging, uh, Bipin has very nicely elaborated the imaging uh, 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 modalities and the views that are used, but I would like to draw your attention to <clears throat> this particular view, which is uh, the, uh, the true lateral view of the scaphoid and not the lateral view of the, uh, of the, um, of the wrist. And this is the ulna oblique view. So you can see here the scaphoid is in complete profile. So this is a this is the long axis of scaphoid in the lateral view, and this is the lateral view of the scaphoid. So it is an oblique of the wrist, but a lateral view of the scaphoid. And in this particular view, you can also look at any humpback deformity or flexion of the uh, fracture fragments or the intrascaphoid angle. Radial and ulnar deviation. Ulnar deviation extends the scaphoid, whereas radial deviation will flex the scaphoid in an otherwise intact wrist. 
but if there are any changes in the scaphoid morphology or anatomy in these views, you would suspect something going on. Um, the DC deformity is usually because of foreshortening of the scaphoid, because of flexion, and it simply means that the uh, dorsal cornu of the lunate is now tilted up, and this is called as a DC deformity. We won't belabor too much on this because this is outside the scope of the talk, but suffice it to say that a scaphoid lunate angle of greater than 60 degrees would indicate a DC deformity. Uh, we usually resort to additional modalities of treatment in the form of a CT or an MRI or at times both. And a CT scan is usually a good idea to assess the union or for the bony uh, uh, architecture to understand the bony uh, union status, whereas the MRI can give you more information about the soft tissue and vascularity status. There are classifications uh, that have been described, Green's classifications, uh, grades them from grade one to six. And uh, there is a classification uh, that has been described by Herbert from D1 to D4. And he takes into account whether there is a fibrous union without a deformity, a pseudarthrosis with early deformity at the top here, a sclerotic pseudarthrosis with an advanced deformity, and a full-blown avascular necrosis with a fragmented uh, proximal pole. Jean Vallon from France also has classified them uh, very simplistically as fibrous, cystic, sclerotic, and avascular uh, non-unions. And you can see in these particular pictures the different types of non-unions that may come across. But suffice it to say, if you look at this particular slide, it's very easy to understand that fractures uh, involving the tubercle or the distal pole or maybe up to the waist, they may always uh, un, uh, proceed to union. However, if there is an obliquity of the waist, which is very obvious, this is where the, uh, the um, analogy to the neck fractures, neck femur fractures comes into play, or a very proximal pole fractures. Now we know from uh, the hypovascular proximal pole, these are the fractures which will usually uh, proceed to non-union. Uh, a very um, a succinct uh, algorithm for scaphoid fracture non-management, non-union management. Uh, if there is a delayed union, you usually just put in a screw to uh, provide rigidity or stability, and this uh, will usually progress to union. If there is an established non-union with a uh, fibrous union, non-union at the waist, you may perhaps do an open repair with or without bone grafting. And but if there is a sclerotic non-union of the waist, uh, you may use a wedge graft. If there is a humpback non-union, again, a wedge graft. And if there is a proximal pole non-union, you may use a vascularized bone graft. Uh, this is, again, uh, an elaboration of the earlier slide. Again, I won't belabor too much on this. But in summary, if we, if we were to look at the treatment options, they will be more or less classified into these uh, few types. So they are percutaneous or open reduction and internal fixation to stabilize a fibrous non-union or an open reduction internal fixation with a bone graft, uh, a pedicle bone graft or a free vascularized bone graft to restore vascularity if there is an avian, or, or more recently, the arthroscopy assisted uh, inter, uh, reduction internal fixation with bone graft. This is the classic uh, technique of uh, Rusi and uh, Matty Rusi technique, where you take a, a, a reverse hockey shaped incision over the FCR extending to the hypothene, the thena remnants. You open the FCR subsheath, you retract the FCR, and then on the capsule, you may make either a longitudinal or maybe a zigzag incision like this to elevate the flaps. The scaphoid non union is uh, exposed, it's curated and cleared. The gap is measured, and in that gap, you would put in a bone graft to restore the length of the scaphoid, thereby correcting the DC deformity. And then you may want to fix it either with K-wires or a screw or whatever is available. You have to take care that the screw is of adequate length and does not uh, overproject in the radiocarpal joint. And this is a schematic diagram to show how the DC deformity is corrected or is basically uh, is present because of scaphoid foreshortening. So it is important that you, uh, you uh, restore the length of the scaphoid by putting in a graft and then you correct the DC deformity. What about vascularized bone grafts? 
uh, you may use if this is the knee joint, this is where the leg is, this is where the uh, this is where the thigh is, sorry, the hip is, and this is where the leg is, and then you take a medial femoral condyle graft from the uh, from uh, based on the descending genicular artery here, and then you can take a graft from the medial femoral condyle and do a free vascular spherical bone graft, or you may use something called as a one two ICSRA. Uh, which is uh, ICSRA, which is a bone graft based on a reverse flow in this particular uh, pedicle here. And then you harvest a bone graft and you flip it to the scaphoid to uh, plug, plug, plug in the non-union side. Arthroscopic assisted bone grafting is also uh, something that is uh, evolving and is a neat adjunct in the armamentarium of uh, the wrist or the hand surgeon. This is a classic example of a uh, bone uh, a scaphoid non-union with uh, bone resorption. And this is a video demonstrating how we do this particular bone grafting in a standard arthroscopic uh, setup. We, uh, we harvest the bone graft either from the radial uh, styloid or from the iliac crest. Our preference is iliac crest. And then we uh, morselize this bone graft and then you put in this bone graft through this small cannula. This is a hypodermic needle cannula that you can just use to introduce a bone graft inside the uh, non-union side. You may also use a small suction tip cannula uh, with uh, trocars or maybe even this, the burr or maybe even a, a small uh, dura separator and pack in the bone graft at the non-union side. And then once that's done, when there is adequate filling up, so this is the capitate for your reference. This is the proximal pole of the scaphoid. This is the distal pole up there. And this is the non-union site here. And then we fill this non-union site with uh, morselized bone graft. And then you, um, you put in a screw with the percutaneous technique. I think that's uh, the next video. So I won't belabor too much on this, but uh, ultimately this is what you get. You can see the small portals, just one and two portals here. And then you have passed your screw from a uh, volar uh, aspect in a retrograde manner. And then this procedure is done in a minimally invasive method. Uh, the same can also be applied to a proximal pole non-union as you can see in this particular case. Uh, and then because this was too small for a screw to hold the fragment, uh, we use K wires and at six months it has gone on to unite as you can see in this particular case. So what is the fate of full failed bone grafts? If your index surgery for non-union fails, the second surgery has a very high, almost a 60% rate of failure. So you have to get your first surgery correct. Now very brief and very passing mention about the snack risk. This is when uh, a scaphoid non-union goes unnoticed or untreated. And then you start developing these arthritic changes because of the non-union, the capitate is trying to push its way down. And then there are increased point contact pressures between the scaphoid and the radial styloid here. It begins with arthritic changes and peaking of the radius. Uh, then it goes to the scaphoid fossa. Then it goes on progresses to the mid carpal joint. And then there is pan arthritis. Uh, there are salvage procedures that you then have to resort to when you're faced with snag crisp, and these are usually excision of the pole, distal pole of the scaphoid, radial stylotectomy, a slack procedure and modifications uh, such as a proximal row carpectomy, uh, wrist denervation, limited carpal fusions, wrist arthrodesis, or a total wrist arthro uh, replacement, which, however, this option is unfortunately not available with us yet. So in conclusion, uh, this is a very commonly missed diagnosis of a very common injury. Uh, we all know that this natural history uh, tends, leans towards development of arthritis and can be very debilitating. Missed diagnosis and inadequate or improper treatment is the most common preventable cause of scaphoid non-union. And I always tell my residents and fellows that it is better to uh, uh, to make mistake on the side of over-treating rather than under-treating and all is not lost even if non-union occurs, accurate diagnosis and uh, uh, appropriate treatment can yet be uh, applied to salvage the, uh, the non-union. With that, I thank you for your attention.